Okay, well, thanks to the help desk for making this possible, and thanks to Arwen for generating all this uh, this new approach to Science Month in terms of a virtual approach. So the presentation that I want to give in this session um, is basically something I presented at Eco Summit in uh, Montpellier uh, last week. So that was um, last week of August, first week of September, for those of you currently in October. And it's also um, a paper that myself and co-authors, you can see those there, are going to be submitting um, to an invited submission to the journal um, Agriculture, Ecosystems and Environment, who are running a special issue on this area. So the basic idea is around sustainable intensification, um, a buzzword, or maybe it's more than that, but certainly a term that a lot of you are going to be have, will be familiar with and will have heard um, increasingly um, in a whole bunch of circles from research, um, the CRPs, um, various policy documents around the world, um, increasingly part of the sort of agricultural intensification, environmental sustainability, social sustainability discourse. So what it is, uh, myself and co-authors undertook a pretty detailed literature review, sort of bordering on meta-analysis um, from the peer-reviewed literature of about 300 papers that looked at what sustainable intensification actually is, where does it take place, what kind of systems, where is it globally, and so on. So there's a whole bunch of different um, ideas within that. And I'd like to present uh, some of those results to you today, and uh, hopefully it'll kind of inform discourse a little bit, maybe provoke a few responses, which is always a good thing. So first slide. What I'm going to try and cover is, well, why do we need sustainable intensification? What's all the big fuss about? Um, what sustainable intensification actually is, according to the peer review literature, but also what it could be from some of its uh, critics. Uh, where it takes place. By that, I mean... Um, what kind of systems is it predominantly taking place in? What sort of production systems? Because there are biases. How do you actually do sustainable intensification? What does it look like? You go on the ground, you're working with communities, you're working with policymakers, what does it involve? And within that, the biophysical and the social science differences that are pretty stark when you analyze those data. And then, how would we go about and this speaks a bit more broadly to what kind of things we've been talking about in B1, but I think across the institution generally, is this idea of evidence dissemination and how you conduct sustainable intensification in a particular context. How transferable is a lot of this stuff? So, next slide. So, sustainable intensification is pretty much ubiquitous within the realms of food production and how it interfaces with sustainability, obviously, but also environmental concerns, biodiversity loss, ecosystem services, um, a whole range of different ideas about how agriculture might be conducted more sustainably without necessarily having clear definitions of what that actually looks like. So there's just a few examples of policy documents, research, um, intelligent media, and so on. But there's been, um, you know, we, we've heard a lot of these terms before. It's, it's, it's a neat term. There's no denying that. Um, it's been around for a while, as I'll show in a, in a moment. But, you know, is, is this the, the kind of the, uh, the holy grail that we've been looking for for fixing up a whole bunch of different agricultural sustainability and environmental degradation issues. Is it too much of a panacea or is it just the latest bandwagon that we've all got to kind of hitch our wagon to for a while and until it sort of fizzles out? Now I'm sure everybody's got their own thoughts on this and you know in some respects it's, it's probably all of these simultaneously but um, let's explore that a bit further. Well the first thing to be sure about is that it sure is popular. Um, that popularity has increased pretty much exponentially over the past five, six years or so from sort of bumbling along. This is the number of peer-reviewed uh, journal papers, incidentally, on, on sustainable intensification that we pulled out of Web of Science and Scopus searches. Um, 
what's interesting to note is that it's really sort of risen since about 2011 and then has just sort of taken off from there. The dip in 2015, incidentally, is because the uh, systematic review that we undertook uh, was only up to and including September 2015 data. So you can expect that that is already off the scale above there, above 100 papers. Um, and for 2016, I wouldn't be surprised if we're already well over um, because there have been a whole bunch more have come out that I've just noticed even without sort of conducting any sort of review. So it is increasing in popularity. Why do we need it? Well, in a basic sense, um, all sorts of projections of world population increase, um, but also changes in consumption patterns towards a more meat, dairy, livestock-based um, protein, animal protein rich uh, diet and there's real concerns developing about how we're going to be able to um, meet those kind of demands over the next few decades. There's also the idea that in an environmental sense you couple this with environmental degradation and this has been sort of conceptualized as this idea of planetary boundaries by Rockstrom but also Will Stefan and a whole bunch of others doing this kind of work. So exceeding in areas like climate change, rate of biodiversity loss, nitrogen cycle and so on, but also um, starting to exceed in other areas as well. And there's also the issue that um, a lot of the land that is suitable for cropping is already being cropped. Um, and the issues that obviously surround clearing yet more native vegetation, particularly in uh, as it moves more into upland areas and the um, the environmental degradation, biodiversity loss, loss of ecosystem services, soil erosion, climate change and so on that can ensue, that indeed does ensue from that. So we need it, but what is it? So we went through all the definitions um, of sustainable intensification and about 150 papers provided a definition of some sort. And the most commonly re-quoted, recited one was this one from the Royal Society in 2009 which is sort of when the popularity of the term started to sort of balloon a little bit. And that is that yields, I'll just quote it directly, yields are increased without adverse environmental impact and without the cultivation of more land. So you take those components and you can sort of encapsulate those in kind of a, a simple little equation that really shows you sort of the way that a lot of the peer review literature on sustainable intensification has been thinking. And so Great, we sort of now know, at least we now know what it's meant to be. Um, and if you look at what we did then, we basically went to the um, individual definitions and we mapped out a whole bunch of different keywords around those 150 or so definitions and looked at the frequency with which they occurred. So this is the percentage of papers that include a particular terms. Well, yield obviously is right up there. That's the main it seems to be the main um, raison d'etre of, uh, of sustainable intensification. Environmental impacts are also in there, and also in about 40% of cases, land area as well. There's also um, a bit more of a nuanced nod towards resource use efficiency. And so, right, so we've got a good idea of what sustainable intensification is, except that about three or four years ago, this paper came out. Actually, more recently than that, 2014, I think, from uh, Jacqueline Luce. Um, at, she was then at Lefana University in Germany, and, and it was a really, really interesting paper because it was one of the first ones to come out and say, "Well, hang on. First of all, all this focus on yield. Well, that may not be the main reason for food insecurity. And some of the central tenets of food insecurity and and uh, and sustainability are not actually ever really ever articulated in sustainable intensification discourse, so that would revolve around things like human rights, access to food, equity, um, equity of distribution, for instance, you know, gendered and so on. Um, nutrition, very rarely mentioned it appears, and a whole bunch of other drivers of food insecurity which don't really seem to ever enter into those definitions of what sustainable intensification is and should do. And so we went back to our literature review and uh, we mapped out, as I say, the different the different elements and if you look at the uh, definitions again well something that we're obviously a couple of things we're obviously heavily involved in agroecology and crop diversity really very rarely mentioned in the definitions of what sustainable intensification should be equity only makes it into six percent waste only makes it in 
to 3%, despite the fact that you know, there is very good evidence to suggest that we waste about 30% of food along the entire sort of production to consumption line. And then the one that I suppose was pretty shocking to myself and, and others on this, this, um, this talk and soon to be paper, was that nutrition is only mentioned in one definition in the peer-reviewed literature up to September 2015 of sustainable intensification. And that's by one of the co-authors on this paper, um, Pete Smith at Aberdeen. So we thought that was pretty surprising. So what are the implications of, of this? Well, let's just pick on nutrition. Um, and thanks to co-authors for putting this information together. Um, it's all about increasing yields, sustainable intensification, but yields of what? It seems to be the fundamental question that's not really being answered. If it's increasing yields of staple crops, then all you're going to basically do through sustainable intensification is produce more energy-dense, micronutrient-poor food. Yield alone is not going to meet a whole bunch of sustainable um, nutrition challenges such as are articulated in the Sustainable Development Goals, um, particularly number two. Um, and if we're basically um, extolling to smallholder farmers in the developing world that they should be undertaking sustainable intensification through a variety of different mechanisms on their farms, um, it's not going to improve their dietary quality and their nutrition if it doesn't expressly and explicitly have nutrition in there. So what would you need to do? Um, in a very sort of broad and simplistic sense, as befits one slide, sustainable intensification needs to start taking a whole of diet approach. I mean, the options are actually designed around specific and clearly identified local dietary needs. And it also needs to start taking note and um, promoting agricultural diversification as a means of ticking off on a number of the central tenets of what sustainable intensification should be about. So with that little rant over with, um, back to the uh, literature review that we undertook. So what kind of systems is uh, sustainable intensification taking place in or being discussed around for the theoretical type papers and conceptual papers in, um, in, these, in the literature? Well, unsurprisingly, uh, the vast majority of papers uh, do deal extensively with terrestrial cropping. And there's a certain amount deal with livestock. And there's also about 20% of papers have some mention, they're not necessarily much focus on tree-based approaches or agroforestry. What was really surprising and something that comes out of the work I've been doing on the Aquatic Agricultural Systems Project, but I'm um, also going to be taking forward on a couple of small grants, um, is that aquaculture is hardly ever mentioned in sustainable intensification peer-reviewed papers. Now there are a few bits of grey literature, some of which are very good, are starting to come out, come out on this, from Stockholm Resilience and uh, FAO, but very little in the peer-reviewed literature. I think there are only about two, three papers actually mentioned it in any great detail rather than just mentioning it as this indicates here. So that was pretty surprising, particularly when you consider um, the benefits of uh, both nutritionally but also in terms of uh, human health and also in terms of greenhouse gas emissions of a pescatarian diet. So that seems to me to be uh, an awful oversight in the sustainable intensification literature. Then how do you actually sustainably intensify? What does it do? Well, we found 154 broad management actions um, from the 300 or so papers. And some of these we've had to do quite a lot of lumping, so it could be a lot more um, uh, finely sliced than is being seen here, but it needed to be manageable. Now, obviously, you can't see these, but what we can do is look at some of the ones that are mentioned most frequently. So some of the ones that get mentioned in uh, quite a lot of the literature on a regular basis are really kind of biophysical and technological management actions. All of them very good, very laudable, got a fair amount of evidence to back them up, um, such as nutrient management, various tillage regimes, no tillage, reduced tillage and so on, soil cover through mulching and composting and so on, and various cover crops, and also things like planting densities, planting timing and so on. So those are things which get really talked about a great deal. Down at the other end, the things which get mentioned in maybe two or three papers out of 300 are often more socio-economic. Um, so things like farmer capacity building, 
knowledge transfer, recognition of local knowledge, improving farmer working conditions, improved NRM policy and implementation, decentralized governance. These are all incredibly vital but hardly ever get mentioned and it really speaks back to that idea that um, that Jacqueline Luce came up with which we're sort of following up with a quantitative review is that this stuff is hardly ever mentioned in the sustainable intensification literature and yet it really really needs to be if it's going to be in any way successful and beyond just another form of agricultural intensification under a different name. So with that out of the way, how do you go about synthesizing this and disseminating evidence on sustainable intensification. Well, some of you may know that I'm quite a fan of this idea of the conservation evidence group, um, which is run by Bill Sutherland at uh, Cambridge University. And what they've basically done is undertaken a huge number of reviews of over 4,000 papers um, that look at management actions for conserving wild biodiversity, so you know, birds, amphibians, and so on and so on. And what they've basically done is set up a, a web platform and a bunch of publications that uh, is a resource to support decisions about how you maintain and restore biodiversity, wild biodiversity. And it's got a big, it's got a summary of all the scientific literature, gives the um, evidence for and against the effects um, and the impacts of conservation interventions on a given group. And it also gives an indication you know, the consequences of those interventions and also then the likelihood that they're going to be successful so that managers have got some idea about what to do in a particular situation. And there's a whole bunch of publications go along with this, all of which are sort of freely available and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty useful stuff. But what I think we'd really like to see in this area is something similar around sustainable intensification and agroecology. Now what they've done is that it's very focused on biodiversity conservation, wild biodiversity conservation. And it doesn't kind of take a multiple ecosystem services or, or multifunctional kind of approach. So what I would like to start looking at with a few colleagues and, and others, um, including potentially that group in Cambridge, is how we might be able to put together something around the lines of an agroecological management um, version of this that would disseminate synthesize and disseminate all the evidence but of course heuristic approach on this that uh, is, is upgraded by information from the field as well as information from the papers. So just in terms of what sustainable intensification might look like, you'll all know this picture, anybody who's ever sat through one of my talks before. Um, this is in Tonle Sap in Cambodia, um, very much a, an aquatic agricultural system in all its glory, so it's got livestock, it's got cropping, it's got native vegetation, it's got capture fisheries, it's got aquaculture, the whole sort of shooting match basically. Um, and this is what, if you took some of those particularly biophysical actions and tried to put them into, from the literature and put them into a, a, a situation in a, in a real landscape, this is what it might look like. But one of the remaining questions around this whole idea of sustainable intensification if it is really going to deliver on its promise is how you then take some of these far more, um, I guess, far more nuanced and far more tricky, um, more sort of uh, socioeconomic issues and nutrition and dietary issues and how you start to apply those in these landscapes as well to truly bring in the sustainability elements to the intensification elements of sustainable intensification. Okay, many thanks for sitting through that and I hope it's uh, sparked a few ideas and thoughts. Thank you.